Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GNC Sessions podcast. And now that we're in series four, what could we do, no less, but bring Mr. John Hammond on the show? Welcome, John. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm even more impressed, actually, that you've been listening to the episodes as well. So you know, and giving us some good feedback. So it's always that's always a that's always that's always a good a good omen. When a new guest comes on, he says, I've listened to this particular episode, uh, all these episodes with other people that I've, I've curated over the last few years, and you, you like them, which is the whole point of doing the show. So yeah. um, welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, where are you joining us from today, then, Mr. Mr. Hammond? Where are you, where, where's, where's, where's Lord Hammond today? Yeah, so I'm currently in Holborn by Holborn Viaduct, um, which is always an interesting place because people don't realise this, but it had... The world's ever first commercial power station uh, was just down the road from here in, I think, 18, 1890 <laughs> or so, um, by, okay. I think it was by Mr. Alexander, uh, I think it was Graham Bell. Uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was oh, Graham it? Bell. Sorry, sorry, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, if you get that right. Um, so Thomas oh, cool. Edison launched his first uh, power station for electric lighting here and then New York a few years later. So it's always a, it's an interesting historic place in the world. And then I um, I live uh, relatively nearish down the road in Hackney, so I've I'm fortunate enough to cycle into uh, cycle around London every day, which is something I, I absolutely love doing. Oh, that's cool. That's my old. That's my old al- alma mater, I suppose, because I was at GE. I was at GE Lighting for a number of years. So Thomas Edison was was the guy that founded the whole companies. <laughs> he was. So, he was amazing. Amazing. Well, goes, amazing. Goes around, come, these, these damn inventors. They stop inventing all this damn stuff. It's, it's you know, it's never <laughs> going to change the world. I mean, it may do. And I, I think it's interesting. I don't. I'm a, quite like history. I think history is a really important thing to to study and look mm. at to understand how things go forward. There's a fantastic um, phrase of history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And I think it's really interesting <laughs> seeing where where Amazon have, have basically placed the, the Amazon Web Services head office so near to effectively what was one of the... the and, I, and I do think you know, cloud at the moment, it affects everything in our lives. And I think it's interesting that it's based so close to where power originally started in... Uh, in the UK and kind of one of the, the first bits globally. So it's an interesting, interesting, fortuitous um, uh, coincidence. I'm, I'm not saying we planned that because I'm sure we didn't, but it's, it's interesting how it's worked out. So, so I suppose you've kind of given a bit of a tease away then. You, you actually talked about, but I suppose my next question was going to be what's going on in, in Mr. Hammond's world. Yep. Um, maybe you could just do a bit of a, a bit of a segue yeah. and we, then we can get into the, uh, the, those, those, the things that I, I would say is so. There's some very interesting posts you put out recently, which I want to talk to you about, and um, some content you've done. Uh, but yeah, I mean, over to, over to you, really. If you maybe you could sh- yeah. share with share where you are with uh, the audience. Do uh, introduction. So yeah, so John Hammond. So um, I lead the specialist business for Amazon Web Services for the UK. Um, so if you think Amazon Web Services for folk that don't know, we're relatively relatively sizable cloud provider. We um, we're quite young. People always think we're this thing that's been around forever, but we're we're coming up to I think thirteen years old. We're actually younger than Uber, which always blows my mind. So you could have you could have gotten Uber wow. before you could have used AWS, which always seems seems very bizarre to me. Um, and in our last financial reports, we're just just tipping over the hundred billion dollar run rate, which is which is pretty good for effectively what is what is still um, by many definitions almost a startup at the moment. Um, so me personally, I lead the specialist business for the UK. I suppose what does that mean? Um, that's I've got a moderately decent team of folk underneath who are, who are very good in kinds of in terms of quality. I'm absolutely fan, the best we've ever worked with, um, and effectively we own a bunch of different services, both technically and commercially across uh, the AWS estate. So that's everything from it all sounds ridiculous when I say it, it's everything from AIML to quantum computing to um, networking to hybrid to autonomous vehicles um, and far far more. Effectively, anything that is um, anything that's relatively unique, technical, challenging, forward-looking um, comes with us to help help customers succeed around all of it. So that's that's me. My background in terms of in terms of kind of how I got here, I suppose I'll briefly briefly talk about. Um, so I've been into tech for for a very 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 long time actually. So I first started coding my BBC Micro when I was three. Um, was was very fortunate to get given one by my my uncle came from quite, <laughs> quite humble beginnings over in West London. Um, so I did that. I'm very dyslexic. So I found it very, I couldn't spell my own name until I was 11, which was, was challenging mm. despite kind of shouting. My, my handwriting is still quite oh, illegible. Really? Wow. Um, but managed to do my 
GCSE uh, information systems when I was 11 at, at night school. My mum used to take me, drive me to every every week, which was nice. And then did my um, A-level computer science when I was 13. So I've kind of done tech from a very young age. Then all right. hit, hit 16 and you know, hormones and, and stuff all kicked in and then got very into... Um, probably too into music and going to free parties around the M25 and all kinds of, all kinds of interesting, the <laughs> early or late, late nineties UK raving of, uh, which was, was quite into the world of drum and bass. Oh, and you were there, were you? I was, I mm. was, you know, places like Helter Skelter and all of these, these interesting things, uh, did that. Went to he's university. already started again though. He's all, he's all, the, the, oh. the, 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 I heard there was that one where they're doing that Ikea, that old Ikea location. They've done it out as, oh, a, I, as a rave, didn't they? Something oh, like a few I months ago. Like, I went to see Basement Jacks there about a month ago, actually, which was uh, which was Basement Jacks and Orbital, <laughs> which was absolutely fantastic. If I'm honest, it was all oh, right. It was really good. Um, so did that. Um, then did university, computer science, uni. Uh, hit 26 and um, parted ways with the uh, the girl that I'd been dating since 16, who'd been quite into some of the um, the same same things as me. And um, then then met a another woman who's now mother to three three children, my, my, all my three children. Um, who kind of said, "What the what the f have you been doing for for the last period of time?" Um, and so I kind of changed directions a bit. I, um, I I basically from twenty twenty six onwards, I've tried to do the hardest things I can find. So my my mantra has literally been: if something's challenging, if it's difficult, try and do that. And it and it's really interesting. I've, I think I've been very lucky that I've been able to optimize my career for learning for the last you know twenty years or so, um, which has been fantastic. And that was. Um, so I was one of the lead architects in the London Stock Exchange. I built low latency trading systems for for a bunch of different banks, mm. um, which was fun. So I was on it was that Flash Boys book people might have seen. So I was almost on the other side of that building trading systems um, and then went into the world of consulting. So I was uh, managing director over Accenture. I think I was the youngest managing director Accenture ever had at the time, which was, was kind of cool, um, and led the DevOps business for them. And then, then yeah, into into Amazon. And for the past few years, until until this year, I've been leading the compute business for the UK and then leading the compute business for all of Europe for Amazon. So it's, so it's been a, it's been an interesting whirlwind journey. Um, and it's one where I'm extremely fortunate to be where I am. I, I, I genuinely cannot believe I've, I've ended up being so lucky doing something that I love, I enjoy, and that keeps me, keeps me challenged and entertained and learning. It's fantastic. It's interesting. I mean, you, I mean, thanks for thanks for sharing that. I mean, that, that's quite a that's quite. A, I wouldn't say a helter skelter. It's more like a uh, more like a roller coaster. <laughs> but um, the um, you say it sounds like you even even though you had those um, you know dyslexia and stuff like that. Actually, you took the exams prior. You took them earlier than what people normally would do. I mean, doing the A levels and O levels at eleven and uh, thirteen. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So there's obviously basically, there's obviously something I'm, going on. Right. Yeah, it's really good. I'm, I'm very. Um, I think I've got an odd. I think I've learned more about my brain as I go. And I think it is really interesting of this concept. Of the only, the only thing, the only real thing to learn about is yourself. Um, and I think it's you know deep, deep mm. behind all that. I've been very lucky in terms of. Um, I'm quite good at making leaps. Like I think, I think the way my brain is set up, I'm very good at almost connecting very disparate things together that people wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, and also from a really early right. age, I kind of realized the stuff that I wasn't very good at. And there's, there's lots and lots of stuff. That I'm, I mean, I'm, there's more things I'm bad at than good at by a long way. Um, <laughs> but I think the whole thing is that I've managed to, you know, like I couldn't, I've, I've managed to work out coping strategies. Like for me, I, you know, I find it very difficult to remember people's names, very, very difficult to remember people's names still. But if I see them and I talk to them and I repeat their own name to them, often when I see them and I'll say, oh, you know, hello, Andrew. And I make sure that I do that. As weird as it sounds, that that kind of sticks in my brain more. Um, and then with tasks, for example, like I'm, um, I find it very difficult. Sometimes quite difficult to remember what I'm doing, remember what I need to do next. So I religiously task task list everything. Yeah, there's a list of I can literally go in and be like, well, this is this is the next thing. This is what I've got to do today. This is what I've got to do tomorrow. And I, and I I'm a firm believer in almost this concept of cognitive load. So I I use um, there's an app I use things which is just brilliant. I couldn't live my life without. And you can almost um, you can schedule tasks. I find, so I find it's one of these things. I think there's, I think doing that, but I think on the flip side, um, for me, it's been extremely lucky being dyslexic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I think it's, it's brought all of these kind of interesting, um, almost superpowers that come with it in terms of some of the stuff that I can, mm. I can do. It's good. So I'm really, I'm really proud of it. And I, I think it's important for people to realize that <clears> those 
aspects of um, what, was, what was that what was that app you mentioned by the way what was the app you mentioned things uh thing things three it's on the on ios it's brilliant it syncs between all my devices it um basically it's it's like a task list on steroids but i couldn't i couldn't cope without it actually and is that, that, is that because um, your brain is is that because your brain forgets what to do next or it just it just doesn't yeah I, I, you just you just can't I, hmm. I find i i find my um I find sometimes my short term memory isn't that great. I, I think I go and I and I think mm. also um, I'm probably a bit ADHD esque if I'm honest. I tend to jump around a lot, and I think actually right. unless I force myself to write things down, they they mm. kind of disappear off. But on the flip side, it means I've got loads of I'm full of energy. I'm you know bouncing off the walls. My 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 days are one one thing to the next thing, and I'm and I'm completely fine with doing that. Um, but yeah, I do. I do find that makes a massive difference, actually. And, do you, and just quick question: Do you, do you create like yeah. focus time blocks? Is that, is that what you do? That you you, you kind of like yeah. you, bro- you block your, you block your diary out? Is that how you get through I, this stuff? So I think this is whole concept of so so what? So I've read lots for years. It's weird. It sounds of like weird weird habits I've had. I've I couldn't really when I was young. I couldn't sleep unless I read a book, um, which. Actually, although that's difficult when you're kind of ten, eleven, and you find it really hard to read, it turns out if you do that for your whole life, it's quite a it's quite a good thing. Um, so I went through a phase quite a few years ago of getting really into reading productivity books, as weird as it sounds. So all these there's this whole almost subset that you can spend an amazing amount of time mm. reading books to, to increase your productivity, which you could argue whether that's productive or not. And there was a um, a movement a while ago called the Get Things <laughs> G- GPD the get things done movement and it was all about you know, how you categorize your tasks you know if you if something takes less than five minutes just do it now mm-hmm. and i've kind of was doing it for a while the thing that i've found with all of it is i do think there's almost this context of um cognitive load i think i think we we were really bad at multitasking i think that's the really the really reality of life and i think people tell themselves they're good at multitasking but they're they're kind of lying to themselves largely and I think the thing that I really try and do is almost hard unitasking. So I'll you know, I'll have things that I need to do. I will either do them. If I'm not going to do them, mm. uh, I will schedule that task for a different period. It disappears out of my task list. And then effectively I can look at them and be like, well, I need mm. to do X, Y, Z, if that makes sense. And the things that I don't, I can't do now for whatever reason disappear off to the next bit. And so, it, so I think the fact that I can feel like it's not oh, so, it creates, so it kind of creates that kind of like that like a kind of like laser guided focus on those ones exactly. that are still on the list yeah okay it's, yeah, yeah. exactly that. yeah mm. so it's, it's definitely I, I thoroughly otherwise recommend. otherwise you otherwise you get confused with all the the, the long list and it's like you, your brain's going oh oh Ex- so be like exactly that. i think that's the thing i think there's mm. too many things for everyone to do that's the reality of it you know if i look at if i look at the total list of tasks i've got there's mm. too many and also there's a bunch of things that I would like to do one day. So there's lots of ideas that I've come up with where I think, you know, one day, yeah, maybe maybe one day I'll do that. And actually, it's I find it quite cathartic that I can take those kind of one day ideas, and you know, I don't necessarily do that. And reality is, 99% of them I will never end up doing. But I've still stored them somewhere that if ever I do turn around and I don't know if I have ever I, if ever I have time, I've got a list of projects I want to build, things I want to build, books I want to write, you know, ideas I've had, things I want to talk about. So it's so it's kind of handy because even despite doing them, somehow it gives my brain closure on them and they, they get put to the back rather than rather than almost hanging around at the same time. Is it like your super wish list then? Is that is like a super it wish list? It is like my super wish list. It, it, consists of, it's, um, it consists of all the stuff that I've put off for very long periods of time that... Um, that ideally I would do at some point because I think there's I think that's the interesting thing at the moment there's yeah and I think it'll be and maybe we'll get into it later about the about AI and how I think that's going to help people I think there is um there are more things to do than than anyone will ever have time for and I think the ability to effectively outsource some of that to um Hmm. easier labor while keeping the the kind of magic that that comes with that human side of things, I think is interesting. So yeah, it's almost like a big super whistle. The things that I probably should do one day, but probably really, if I'm honest to myself, I probably won't. But just just losing them for good seems like a kind of waste, as weird as it sounds. I think there's been mm. some really, there's interesting things in there that I'd love to, I'd love to sit down and spend, you know, a, a day or a week or a year doing. Um, so yeah, but at the moment, my uh, my life is 
extremely busy with a combination of you know, relatively um, relatively challenging but but rewarding job. Three three kids um, who are still quite young, and my wife has added two cats to the mix. So now I've got um, I've got as my uh, middle child told me, I've got seven things that I need to keep alive currently. Um, no dog then, no dog yet. <laughs> no dog, no dog. Yeah, not 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 yet, not yet. I think that's the. I think. Um, well, you see, that's but... what you can do. You, see, you can get a dog. You, you can get a dog, and you can take it for a walk. You see, that'd be your peace time. That'd be your thinking time. Well, this is and this is why I find. Um, so I, I quite like doing exercise. I, I I don't know how. Um, I like running. Although I, I can't run because I hurt my back a bit. But normally I run quite regularly, and that for me is my time of of switching off from I don't bring right. a phone with me I, I've just got a watch that, that and I think actually it's the almost the closest to meditation that, that I like doing because I I mm. completely forget about the world and all of the things around it and I think it's you know we do definitely um we live in this kind of hyper connected world where I think people yeah don't spend enough time just focusing on individual things it's, it's really interesting you think of you know when you when you look through the the various apps out there um the reality is the thing that's being sold through all of it is your attention. It's your, it's your time and your attention that's being sold. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it's being sold yeah. in increasingly small pieces. And I think, you know, I do mm. kind of, I mean, it's like, like why I try and make an effort to, to read. I think people underestimate actually the value of having kind of consistent focus on something of sitting down and reading a book for an hour. And I know that sounds like a, mm. something that you think everyone would do, but it's, but it's it's weird. It's um, you know I find it ama- amazingly uncommon for people to actually sit down and and read. As sad as that sounds. Show you a couple of ones I'm reading. Uh, this is always good read. Ah, I've read I've read that. Yeah, I read that as a child. As weird as it sounds, <laughs> this is why I think I was quite a strange <laughs> child. If I'm honest, I, I remember reading it. There's some very then, good things then, in it though. And then this is... the mountain you're oh, on. There. There's some brilliant, awesome, some yeah. brilliant principles in there. Yeah, but this one. He's a very good one. Yeah, I like Spike Milligan. I do like Spike Milligan. Exactly, Spike Milligan's meaning of life. So that's like two. That. That's two in my in my my happy flappy box or bag. No, I'm, so, I'm currently um, reading a upbeat um, man's man's search for meaning, which I've meant to read for ages. All about a psychiatrist right. in a World War II um, concentration camp, and it's it's. It's not upbeat by a long way, but yeah. it's really, it's just really it's interesting. Very famous. It's really, oh, it's a no. brilliant book. It's a brilliant one of the best books I've read in ages, actually. Mm. I've got that, and then mm. what's the other book I was reading? Um, I've got a book by the co-founder of DeepMind that I was my ne- is my next one, and a book about material science, actually, which I, I quite like. I quite like material science, I must admit. So Victor Frankel, the the, the man Victor Frankel. Meaning, that's the book. That's the chat. Yeah, I would I would mm. recommend that to anyone. It's I mean it's. It's very, it's, it's terrible, but it's it's really interesting hearing about how people deal with life when they're almost in the the, the worst situations. And I think, you know, I think it is really interesting for us to think about. Um, I, I like consciousness research. I quite like understanding how how the brain works and how people. There's a, a fantastic book mm-hmm. called uh, "A Thousand Brains" by Trip Hawkins. That's probably the other one that I've read recently that I think was 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 brilliant. Um, who has the the best almost humble brag in that book I've ever I've ever read in my life where he um he talks through about how he used to he was quite into neuroscience and then he he made a small startup sold the small startup and then went back into doing neuroscience so I was thinking I definitely recognize that name and you look in and it was Palm that he founded and then sold for somewhere in the region of I think 20, 20 billion or so um so it's a bit it's a fantastic book absolutely what, fantastic. what palm the palm pilot that, that, that palm kind of, pilot so the, the, the founder pilot. of the founder of palm one well, of the co-founders of palm um effectively has a neuroscience research lab and has done some really interesting research onto the um uh the evolution of intelligence and how that applies to neural networks it's absolutely absolutely fascinating that's very interesting. I mean, I don't. Know, I think you reposted Linus's email, didn't you? The or post on, on LinkedIn. I think you, the, the one with the, with the other day. I reposted it as well. The one about the, um, you know, the, the, about the Palm Pilot, actually, wasn't it? I think he's put it, put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's. I mean, it's. I think it's really interesting to think forward um, because I do think. We're, I mean, I think tech is an interesting, very interesting. I mean, it's something I've I've done my whole life. Um, and I think we are at a uniquely interesting time of it. 
so I think there's always this concept mm. of if you looked at um, industrial revolutions, um, and it's again, it's really interesting looking back at history, first, second, third industrial revolution. You know, industrial revolutions tend to happen when there's a new general purpose technology. So when something turns up, which doesn't necessarily immediately have a, um, a core or singular use case. So, you know, if you think of electricity, for example, or you think of mechanization and steam power, it, it has some uses, but actually some of those uses weren't, weren't necessarily instantly instantly viewable um same thing with electricity mm. and the mechanization of factories it's, it's kind of not exactly always there and same in the, the third and i think now we're at an even more interesting revolution that's happened before because most of the time those prior rev- rev- revolutions there was kind of a smaller number of these general purpose technologies um mm. and they always normally come with societal uh, change at the same time that you know, if you look back from the, mm-hmm. the kind of urbanization or the um, you know women entering the workforce there's all kinds of interesting things that happen at the same time during a lot of them and I think the difference we have now is that it's not just one general purpose technology or not just two there are a whole bunch of them coming up really landing within within a couple of years of each other so you know whether that's either um, AIML, whether that's cloud computing, I think that ability to, to access power on demand at, at large scale, I think quantum computing is going to have massive impact. Um, and I think actually the reduction in space launch cost, cost is going to be going to be absolutely unbelievable. And they're all kind of kind of hitting together. And I think the, the this, uh, this thing called the Penrose Gap. So the Penrose Gap was the time it took for um, quality of life to go uh, back to kind of where it was, as weird as it sounds. And if you look at the first industrial revolution, the, the sad hmm. reality is the average quality of life for people was worse during the first industrial revolution. It was worse for quite a, quite a period of time. You know, you're talking 90, 100 years or so that actually people's lives got worse. Uh, cause they went from, hmm. you know, relatively stable kind of farming, agricultural lives into these kind of you know, pretty, pretty hellish places. And yeah, that's happened. Oh, you mean you three... mean with the you mean the factory, the, the, the tailor kind of modern, the tailor, tailorism and all that kind of stuff with the factory exactly. model? Exactly, mm, exactly. Okay. The average person's life. And I think, you know, it's interesting as we as we kind of come into the fourth industrial revolution, it's it's re- genuinely important for us to make sure that if there is that, if that same thing happens, that actually people's lives get better as quickly as they possibly can. Um, because I do think there's, you know, there's, there's definitely interesting consequences that, that exist around a lot of this. Um, and I think that's something that, that kind of is on all of us to to make sure that we we resolve as quickly and as beneficial as we can for for kind of all of humanity, um, and it's kind of a fun thing to yeah, be cause... in the middle of. It. I mean, that's that's why that's why I enjoy what mm. I'm doing. Yes, if I'm honest. Well, it's kind of like it's, I mean, I, I get what you, so what you're saying is a cycle time. The actual from the from initial initial it's kind of collapsing. Yeah, yeah. But it's also the kind of S curve of innovation is kind of like accelerating as well into the actual angle of it. Exactly. It's kind of, like the, 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 kind of it's the combination of both those. Um, plus, and it's like, I mean, I, just, I, just, I described it as, I mean, I was in, I went to a, uh, I presented at a conference last, last year in, in uh, Copenhagen mm. about the, I called it Beyond Gen AI, yeah, mm-hmm. talking about what's, what, what's uh, happening. And basically, it's talking about, you know, the whole thing about, um, you know, role definite, role, role changes, job changes, yeah. uh, you know, what, what really, are you, you know, there's all this tsunami of marketing, but actually, where are you going to apply it? Yeah, for yep. real, real use cases, yeah. a kind of real difference. And how do you measure and manage it? How do you manage to transition to that? Because it's it is a bit of a black box. You know, some of these are a bit of a black box, so it's a bit scary for some execs. So how do you help that transition? How do you educate people? Um, and also, you know, if you don't change, it's a classic Charles Darwin thing. You're going to get it's going to be roadkill. Yeah, you're, you're going to get run over. So you've got to, you know, and you add all those things together, and it's a hell of a it's a hell of a um, a thing coming down the highway. It's a juggernaut. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I couldn't you know, agree more. I mean, I think it's it's interesting. You look, you look at you look at you know you look at your your children. You look at your children, my children. You know, so I've got two boys, Ben and James, mm-hmm. and um, they're going different routes. But you know, mm-hmm. you know, being a child now, being a being a you know, like when you were you know doing your so you, you know three, you said three, you got your BBC Micro at three, and then you were That's doing it. your eleven plus or whatever, at eleven or whatever, or your O levels. You know, if you look at what what those kids are going through now. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing. I mean, you know, the thing they can do on, I'm not going to mention any products, but you know, those different, those different things that ends in T. <laughs> um, 
you know, different cons consumer facing products. Yeah. That, that basically oh. it's just, it's basically it's like the iPhone effect, right? You know, I, I was, you know, I, I, as you know, I've been in the telco industry, mobile industry. And, you know, I, I watched the, over the weekend, I watched Blackberry, the film Blackberry, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you've seen it from last year. It's absolutely mind blowing. It's an absolutely mind blowing film. I would definitely recommend to go and see it because actually yeah. I had it. I had, you know, those Blackberries, you know, with the, the keyboard and literally it shows the time. It shows the time when literally Steve Jobs did the keynote and he released oh. the iPhone and it shows them all in the office in, in, in Waterloo, Ontario, I think it was in Canada. And there's like the CEO and all the founders, and they're looking at the screen. They're going, and, and you know, there's no keyboard basically. They went from like, you know, the trio, mm -hmm. the crap, you know, the BlackBerry yeah, yeah, to yeah. like the full screen, yeah. and they're all going, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And then literally, the founder went into his office, and he starts breaking up these all these different devices and trying to create a full screen version. Right? Then he, they fly to New York. He flies to New York. He tries to convince convince for Verizon. That ah oh, this this screen stuff you know screen full screen thing it's not going to work it's not the way forward, but then he says oh by the way we're going to be releasing a full screen thing a full screen device shortly so he basically he he, he kind of dis, dis, you know, discounts the competitor and then says oh we're going to do it ourselves the, 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 but the interesting thing is and I don't want to get political about this but there's a certain country which manufactures obviously lots of different devices right it's in in the east right and he the, the interesting thing about BlackBerry I didn't know this. They never want to do manufacturing in the east. They want to do it, you know, basically control the quality. Yeah. And then the last, the last part of the film, he's in the founder, God bless him, is in is in the fact is in the kind of the storeroom, opening up the device and doing the quality assurance on the device. And what he, unfortunately, what he always worried about, because they had to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, transpires in that last that last that last scene it's absolutely it's like my god and yep. you don't realize when you don't Sorry. realize when you've when you've been living through that that industry but you know like you haven't been in that room where those yeah. people would see the impact of their strategy being decimated yeah. by apple yeah. right for example it's just it's just remarkable it's, it's i mean I, I was like <laughs> you know when, when, when they, were, they were shipping millions and millions of units to, to you know, they, they owned forty, they owned forty five percent of the market. That one I, company, uh, and they went I from forty five percent to zero. I mean, it's just incredible. So I used to be. So people talk about jobs, jobs going and being um, subsumed by new technology. I was a Bez administrator in Citigroup many, many years ago in my uh, my career. So I was literally a specific Black BlackBerry Enterprise server Are admin. We? <laughs> Was. When you said oh, when you said when you said Bez, I thought we were going about the kind of raving. Yeah, again, not like, you know, the guys no, from it, always, it, always, it always makes me smile. No, I was a a, a eh, Bez eh, eh. admin. Eh. Yeah, <laughs> so I, uh, I I literally used to have to basically pick up people's BlackBerry accounts and move them from from place to place. Oh, really? From, but yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> it was so, as weird as it sounded, that that is you know roles that do not exist anymore. I can pretty much say there are. Or very very few Bez server admins out there, so so it's it's interesting. I'm, I mean, the really clever thing that Apple did um, actually was the move to capacitive touch. That was that was the the genius. I mean, it's it's mm. one of these weird things people forget about that before the iPhone, every single device ever had been resistive touch. It was I think I believe it was the first. It was definitely the first ever consumer available capacitive touch screen, and that's had such mm. an impact on everything we use. If ever you go back to using a resistive touch screen, it's it's hideous absolutely hideous no it's just it's you mean so like a resistor between be, be, behind the key is that what you're thinking about yeah. yes so if you remember right. um so there was like i had a um so i used to develop mobile apps for symbian for uiq randomly so i had a, mm. a yeah um, even back then i had I remember having a uh, um a the symbian scion handheld scion 3 and a scion 5 and scion 5 was early touchscreen that i used to play spectrum games on randomly and it was all you kind of had to poke it enough <laughs> that it, that it Frogger, felt Frogger, true. yeah, Frogger, Jet Set Willy, um, yeah, it was it, it was interesting. That, you know, that was the that was the fantastic day. that, and I think you know it's it's interesting. Like my whether you should or not, my my two year old will uses the iPad sometimes, and it's amazing that we've created a technology that's just so intuitive to use that anyone can use. There's no no training them people how to use it. It's just 
you know you you zoom in you zoom out you kind of you you, you click on what you want and it's really interesting well, did, didn't you see did you ever see that video did you ever see that video on, on social media where there was that there's that there's that little girl she's got an ipad her mum's giving her an ipad and she's just flicking she's just flicking she's flicking yeah. through this kind of like cartoon like with a finger like this it's just incredible it's amazing um, yeah it's absolutely you know just, absolutely and you know she's supposed to be like 18 months old or something like that you know but, but i think this is the thing is that, that this that, you know we've both been in technology for you know too many decades um i suppose that's the thing is it's it's like where is it where is it going and you know should we be fearful should we be um yeah. i know we touched on something before we, before we opened the show today was you know what what is there's always a yin and a yang to it <laughs> um yeah. you know I, I saw you i saw you or um your article that you shared about the spear fishing stuff in hong kong oh, yeah which i thought was fascinating I mean, which i thought was absolutely mind-blowing yeah i don't know if you want to share I mean, that little story briefly because yeah it's, for, it's, for uh, your listeners that haven't heard of it yet i think um so there's a concept of phishing, which most people know, of where you you send out generic emails or generic communication, and well, there's also you know, that you... thing where you fish. We got a rod, you know, we got a rod. There is, there is, like, there is know, that. You... The uh, there is, there is that as well. I should, I should, I, should, I don't want to. I don't know. Well, uh, that's the first. That's the first version. Happen. That's the first version. <laughs> <laughs> but you think before, you know, fishing was was kind of done on a, and it, and it's really interesting when you look into. There's there's some great statistics of that actually phishing emails are badly written from a purpose perspective. Because you're trying to aim to catch people who aren't necessarily, you're not saying not the brightest, but are willing to believe things that are quite unrealistic. So it's really interesting. You know, the, the reason mm. that it's a, it's a it's a prince from a far off land, or that you know, I've, I've got one the other day saying that Warren Buffett suddenly had realised he he owed me a hundred million dollars, which which was nice, but moderately moderately unbelievable, I would say. Um, but it's they're purposefully almost unbelievable to try and catch those people who are who are more likely to be susceptible. Then you go into to something that's happened for a while called spear phishing, and spear phishing's existed for a while, and that's the these really targeted attacks where you'll you'll turn around and you'll you know you'll you'll surf, you'll work out what someone's who someone's wife is or their children or something along those lines, and you'll make these these very crafted targeted attacks. Um, what's starting to happen now is effectively spear phishing through through the use of AI, and this is it's an unbe- almost unbelievable story um, from a, an unnamed Hong Kong financial institution that, that's all come out in the paper. And effectively, um, they managed to find one of the financial controllers. He had a 15, 15-person 15 Zoom call uh, with 15 other people who he thought were, were com- uh, company employees, including the CFO. And um, what happened is someone had basically using um, some publicly available videos, understanding the organization, um, and deep faking it, None of the people on that call were real, which I just find it's just mind blowing. So effectively, he was having a conversation with 15, 15 faked versions um, and went through and transferred 25 million for a secret project effectively to uh, to the, the fraudsters that were doing it, which is just which is amazing. And, it, and it's interesting thinking now the time and effort that would have taken. It would have been significant to do it. What I think is going to happen mm. in the near is things like that are just going to get easier and easier and easier. You know, the ability, so they're listening to um, something the other day where they reckon you need about three seconds of someone's voice to accurately clone them now. Um, so going into a situation where, you know, whereas before you almost do these targeted mails, you can definitely see these options where, you know, you almost have a combination of, link, a combination of LinkedIn, of working out um, mm. who people are connected to, the companies they work for, publicly available data sets, and almost set off these really these really intelligent uh, large scale attacks where all of a sudden lots of people get called by who they think is their boss who they think is one of their co-workers it's i think it's going to be really really interesting to see some of the um the offensive technologies that are deployed in it and i think you know that's the 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 weird thing about ai um i think there's so many there's so many different usage for it i think so many of them are positive but i think one thing it's going to end up in um there was a there was a video from a from another company that was that was showing its new uh, some of its new AI technologies. It's new. It, it's basically um, I'm not going to mention the name, but they've they've integrated AI into their uh, their webmail and some of their their clients. And they they didn't mean it to be a dystopian future, but it, it kind of was because effectively you had um, someone sitting there. They had a a mail come in for their team. They asked the AI to summarize the mail. So they didn't read the whole thing effectively, which I kind of I kind of get. Then they asked them to take a couple of those summaries and make a new document for it. So then they made this new document that 
effectively they couldn't even be bothered to really look at or really spend that much time on. They sent it out and then they um, they asked to they they said they want to send a nice thank you mail to their team. And so they typed in nice thank you mail to the team and it ended up spitting out, you know, a page full of text that all of those people would have would have likely read. And I think, you know, we're gonna be in this weird future, I think, in the near term where lots of people's AIs are gonna be talking to lots of other people's AIs to um, to get through it. Right. Because I think the, the, the amount of the amount of um, traffic that people will get in terms of extending. So, so it's interesting where that will go. But I think fundamentally, the ability to have, you know, a teacher that always cares or a, a person that knows you better than your, sorry, not person, a, um, a system that knows you better than yourself almost and your, your goods, your bad points, your the way you learn, that kind of, you know, real augmented human style of thing, I think is, you know, for mm. me, is extremely, extremely interesting. I think if it's done right, it... Yeah, it has massive productivity gains and fun and interesting things that can that can happen for the benefit of everyone. How, so. I mean, we we touched on this before as well. But how do you, how do you put in the oversight? I mean, that's the thing I I can't work out yet. How do you because you know effectively they're building this, you know, to the that future point in time where you know the super intelligence you know becomes that that's the thing that you know. I mean, I, I don't want to yeah. say that there's a connection between the future and Hollywood. But you know, yeah. some of this stuff is actually is that you know, you know, um, you know, you're gonna be getting Arnold out of, out of kind of um, you know, be kind of a, a, a deep fake of Arnold Schwarzenegger with his uh, Terminator thing because he's he's actually that that's the thing I can't work out yet, or I'm not really aware of it. Maybe you've read some books about it, but it's like um, how do you keep the appropriate? You don't want to you don't want to control it like a bureaucracy, but you also because you want to unleash that the power of it. But also, how do you govern it? Or how, I mean, govern implies bureaucracy implies, you know, slowness and not speed. I don't know. It's, it's, it's that kind of difficult. Difficult. It's like how do you get the balance right? I suppose. Yeah, that, and I think um, so. A lot of it. There's a, the concept of something called Moloch. I don't know if you've ever heard of Moloch. It's quite an interesting concept. That's so a fishing. We're going back to fishing. We're going back to fishing again, are we? I know that's Pollock. 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 Mo- Moloch <laughs> is a. Um, <laughs> Uh, or uh, mollusk, uh, mollusk. I was thinking, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's he's, he's not a nice person. Effectively, it's uh, it's it appears in the, the Hebrew Bible a lot of times. Um, it's basically a, a kind of quite a bad demon from many many years ago. But the, the whole thing of this concept of Moloch is almost um, ending up doing increasingly bad things that almost compete and get worse. So, so and you can kind of see this 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 more principle of it in in what ha- what's happened before in time so if you look at um and i think it's good that we're aware of it so you look at um face tune i don't i don't know how much you you personally post on snapchat or or use these these pieces um but there's all this the whole time thing. in fact as soon as i come off this episode i'm going straight on that yeah <laughs> but there's all these concepts <laughs> of um beautification filters so you can kind of put a filter on your face that makes you look more attractive and the reality is no one really wants to use them. It doesn't doesn't really have any benefit for one person to use a, a beautification filter. But what ends up happening within the market is as soon as one person uses it, or one person uses it on their Tinder profile, or whatever people date nowadays, then all of a sudden everyone else is almost um, disadvantaged as a result of it. So then, actually, all of a sudden the market right. readjusts. So it, it levels people up. People people exactly. level up. Yeah. Exactly, and it's almost it's almost the negative. It almost kind of brings people you down. You by the way, you shouldn't be t- you shouldn't be saying that you're going on Tinder on the on a public oh, podcast. Not. You know, I mean, you, yeah, you know, you not, should... of, uh, of thing, I, ha- I have uh, enough busy <laughs> in my life without anything else. I can assure you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, but almost you end up with this concept that this it's almost race to the bottom that comes around it because suddenly then everyone mm-hmm. starts. You know, if you don't use this, you you're disadvantaged, and then okay, well once you get yeah. to that point, well. Well, actually, maybe your profile pictures. Well, you know, actually, maybe it's not just your face you want to change in the profile pictures. It's the background ones, and you you kind of get in this downward spiral. And I think um, mm. you know, we've had an interesting. So, so I think humanity has had some of its first um, experiences of large scale AI with social media. I think the mm. the rate for attention that happened with social media, I think, was absolutely fascinating. Where yeah. you know, again, people being the product. Um, and I think you could argue there's been there's been some very good things that has come out of it. I think actually you have people feel connected in certain ways, but then there's also been some some more challenging things that have happened around it. And I think we need to we need to kind of realise what happened previously, 
and work out how we make it better this time. I, I really think it's it's really important because I do well, think well, that... that's that's the thing because I think all all the all the you know there's a lot more dialogue now about that social media was you know has been you know handled badly you know executed badly and it's affected generations of, of, of individuals yep. humans on the planet right um you know i i uh, you know I, I had the pleasure of having uh you've probably seen the social dilemma uh the film yes. the social dilemma you know the one was on netflix yeah so uh joe toscano who wrote the oh, book amazing. automating humanity he's going to come back on the show oh, um he came on the show about four years ago and uh he's going to come on the show again he's doing something very interesting now but he was working with tristan harris on yep, lobbying yep. the US government, and he's actually in the show, he's actually in the film with Tristan. You know when they were talking mm -hmm. about all the ex Twitter guys, Facebook guys, yeah. Meta guys, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's just, I mean, it's just uh, some of those scenes in that film are just incredible, especially if you've got uh, you know children and a family uh, about the reaction of you know not having that that you know that device that device yeah. in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know there's a, there's a lot of culpability there. But yeah, what what is what can we learn from that social media? Yeah. phase it's still think, going on it's still going like yeah. a tsunami and what do you do for the future that's the, that's the thing yeah, that's, I don't the, think, that's the I think that, conundrum so so what do i think is going to happen in the long term i think part of it is around diversity of models i think it's and i think some of it comes back i think i think some of it will probably happen by default but i think it's it's important that we we actively move this direction from my perspective so you know, I think some of it. Some you can always look down to um, what a if you if you. I think if you start to look down as to what intelligence is, I think you can see interesting commonalities in terms of the way it's been delivered for us. I'm, I like I like fractals personally. I think fractals you see everywhere from whether it's from the the leaves of a tree looking like the, or the roots of a tree and the smaller bits looking like a big tree in itself, or whether it's like coastlines or pieces like that. Like efficient systems end up mm. being fractals to a large extent. And I think when you look at intelligence intelligence in itself is is very much a fractal system both across mm -hmm. individuals and societies i mean it's you know if, if i think to myself what is the most intelligent thing that i think exists and i think it's human civilization i don't think i think all of human civilization is far more intelligent than than, than one or or particularly individuals and i think it's interesting when you think about um humans in yourself so in terms of you know what makes what makes me me what makes the intelligence with me i I don't believe there's one single piece within it. I think actually there's lots of different bits within my brain that have have kind of intelligence and a voting network that sits over the top. Of it. I think it's the most, there's lots of mm -hmm. lots of good research that kind of says that. And then you forward to neural networks and what's happening at the moment, where we're kind of coming into these interesting positions where we've got these these giant foundational models and they're you know they're huge, absolutely amazing what's been done, but they're almost these kind of islands of intelligence. And I think those islands of intelligence mm. are more challenging one because i don't think that's an efficient way i think nature has nature has kind of evolved the most efficient outputs of these in the long term but then two by i think having these individual islands of intelligence you lack the diversity of thought that an overall system has you know the, the, one of the fantastic reasons that humanity has lasted so long and been so useful is the fact that different people have different views with a voting system which yes. is the moment of capitalism that, that sits over the top of it so so what do i think um where do i think this fits in I think actually diversity of models is really, really important. I think that's one of the things that, that I think is is definitely coming through. And I think it's it's interesting how how that's kind of balanced with this concept of either open weight or because they're not really open source or open weight models. I, I'm a firm believer personally in in open weight and open source. I think it's important from a model perspective. It's it's really important for humanity that we don't end up with just a couple of co companies that have effectively closed source their models. I think that's more risky than the <laughs> side of it um but i do think it's um you know where do i think this will go i almost imagine this future where you rather than querying one specific um ai company online that a lot of people do you almost ask a um a kind of mixture of experts I mean, and it's you know, it's not a new thing almost this mixture of experts approach where you put a put a request in and that in itself goes over to a lot of large numbers of different foundational models um mm -hmm. using it network over the top to come back and i think that's that's something that i think be a you know that and i think that will have very good things to the world i mean yeah what we're trying to do at the company at the moment is build some of the substrate that that can run on um you know fundamentally mm. what we we're doing a lot of the work we're doing at the moment now is to 
is to build the the infrastructure and the way for people to to build pieces like this but yeah i think there's i think that's the way you the way you kind of have a happy ending of it all is by making it fair making it diverse make it a situation that actually everyone can help create and do these things i think otherwise you just you kind of get this weird situation I mean, what the, the one of the biggest one of the biggest i think um for me indicates the health of a society is almost social mobility i think the ability for people mm-hmm. to go both up in terms of um their position and down yeah that, that's the reality people that people sometimes yeah, go yeah. down to, i think that's the right thing and i think as we go into ai we need to make sure that we don't just concentrate those that kind of model um that model uh specificity specificity um into a into a small model, number of models owned by by large um large individual companies i think that diversity is really really important for it. i think that that will end up with a a better long-term outcome from from everything i can see yeah so you move you move everybody up effectively you don't just move certain a certain segment up yeah yeah and, exactly, well, I mean, exactly. <laughs> we could get into some very very politically uh touchy subjects there that based on recent events in davos but i'm not going to go there <laughs> yeah yeah um, i mean so i think so i think that's yeah i think that's the way to do it i think you know, regulation is going to be interesting for ai because um mm. it, you know you you need to i think we don't want to over regulate something too soon but i think there does need to be some regulation around it um and i think mm. also it's you know we don't this this there's certain things where we need to we need to worry about using stuff now and taking advantage of it than than maybe worrying about the the maybe the the future that that may or may not come. I think sometimes that, that saying it's it's important to do it in a safe. Yeah, I mean you can you, you can over, it's like it's like you know if you've got a startup or whatever you know you can you can undercapitalize it and you can overcapitalize it. I think you can you can you can undergovern it and you can over overgovern it and you can stifle like innovation and that kind of like the the you know the failure and the white space yeah. and all that kind of good stuff um yeah I mean, we, so I we think see one, of, one of the one of the, the challenges we see startups doing a, a, a bunch of times is they they try and solve problems they don't have yet and we've seen that all the time mm. in startups where we'll we'll talk to people and they'll say right you know we want to design this thing it needs to scale to a million users and we'll kind of say well you, you can do that but actually, if we talk through, you're you're probably only going to have a thousand users on the platform, and that million mm. users is fantastic and aspirational. But if you get to the problem, if you get to a million users, you can just fix it then. Just just get the thing to work for, yeah, the, yeah. for the thousand users. And I think yeah, you know, yeah. we want to make sure we don't do the same issue with AI of of worrying about you know what's going to happen um, if if suddenly you know this this AGI or, or SGI turns up, and actually we look at solving mm. for problems. Um, that exists exists now effectively. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's quite funny what you just said about that capacity planning thing. Um, it's um, based on the, the the amount of time it takes to provision services from your 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 outfit. That's not really an yeah. issue. Before you speak, okay, I need to raise a purchase order, and then we need to manufacture the servers. <laughs> then we need to install Linux or whatever. <laughs> it's like see in about three months. You know, like exactly. around three minutes. <laughs> it's just like get some relativity yeah. in it. And I think that's the you know, I think it's. I, th- I read. Um, I think I think people need to make sure that you reduce the requirements on a system, like the this this whole concept of people. People sometimes get get lost with what the MVP or what the most you know, the easiest thing to do when you're to the easiest way to be successful when you're building something is to need less need to build less to be successful. You know, if, if you're trying to build mm-hmm. a MVP, the, the the key piece on that really is people build, build try and build these uh, almost VPs, these viable products. The key thing is what is mm. the minimum, what is the smallest smallest thing. And I think when people go through and look at this, one of the things they don't do enough is you should when you when you cut down on what you're going to build, and the same thing as, as we're going into the world of AI, you, know, you should be cutting down almost too much and adding stuff down. You've not. You've not removed enough unless you need to add some things back into that system. Is but, but, this, but this, see, that's where you play into the human, you know, knowing engineers, right? And, you know, I started off as a developer many, many moons ago. People like to buy, build features. They'd like to say, oh, I yeah. built that shiny toy. I built that algorithm. I built this. I, look at how good I am, right? But actually, what's the relevance to the actual pe- to the customer you're trying to support? And that, that's, the, that's the dichotomy, I think, of some of that stuff is that you've got to manage that. Otherwise, the engineers take over the asylum. 
Yeah, um, no. so it's a balance. Yeah, you've got to you've got to think about what what are the ramifications of that because you know you've got all these people coding stuff, coding stuff, coding stuff. Right, okay, you got a lot of code, but actually it's unmanageable. You know, it's it's, it's really it's, I find you fascinating. That we code it had a come. There's there's definitely a concept of um, I find CV driven people talk about um, behavioural driven development and different kinds of development pieces. I find uh, CV mm. driven development the strangest thing, which we definitely see where people effectively will. Um, will choose the tooling, will choose the requirements, really based on padding out their CV. And and it happens, you know, a, a few years ago, everyone started using React, and so much of it was, yeah, okay, yeah. You want to, why, why do you want to use React? Oh, oh, because you think it's it's a it's good. I mean, and it's so it's interesting. Hot. So I think so much. Yeah, it's hot. It's mm. what seemed it what seemed sexy at the time, and it feels like it'd be good for my career. And I think um, I, I like realism. I think maybe. maybe Maybe it's because I'm very dyslexic. I don't know. I find it very difficult to um, to. I can't lie at all. I'm very like transparent on what I think, um, and it always mm. seems bizarre to me that people the the mental loops that people take to almost convince themselves reasons behind why they're doing when really it's really obvious they're doing it to to, to kind of benefit themselves in ways that don't benefit. Themselves. So it's 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 fasc- it's absolutely fascinating. Well, I, I was I, I mean I haven't read, 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 written this, but I was I was considering writing a book. You know, remember that that book? You know, men are from was it women are from Venus, men are from Mars? Yeah. So I was actually going to write one like uh, developers are from Venus, you know, um, testers are from Mars. It was like it's kind of like because uh, <laughs> you know that. I've been working, you know, I, I run a run a London testing meetup group and um, yeah. this like um, the, the testers were always felt like they were being picked on and, you know, not, not being valued as much as a developed rock star developer. I said, well, yes, I'm a rock star, I'm a rock star tester then. Because, you know, if you don't, you, you know, you code, you code it, but then if you don't test it, it's, it's, you know, especially with these time maps, it's disaster, oh. right? It's complete, complete car crash. Well, so, um, I think. I think you almost have this interesting situation. I mean, we we do. Um, so you know, I've I've started doing all my development um, using Code Whisperers, mm-hmm. using a Gen AI tool alongside, which is which is really interesting. Actually, I, yeah, the one thing if people people are technical and listening to this, I'd, I'd recommend using. And there's there's you know, there's a number out there. There's there's uh, Code Whisper from us. There's GitHub Copilot. There's all kind. Of, there's some open source ones you can use as well. But it's really interesting, kind of developing alongside this this kind of slightly different intelligence that, that works. It's not. It's not like pair programming with an actual person. It's kind of like pair programming with a kind of almost weird savant, the idiot savant almost that's that's working alongside you. But one thing on the testing side right. of things, actually, it's interesting. Will will development actually d- not disappear, but will development scale down and testing scale mm. up? Because a piece where I think mm. actually it's easier. It's hard. It's hard for an AI to know what it needs to test at a high level. Yes, it can it can work out the subtesting bits, but because the testing is inherently linked to the output. So if you if you can write the tests mm. well enough, at what degree yes. almost to the you know, monkeys and typewriters writing Shakespeare. I mean you imagine you've got a, a kind of a load of monkeys sitting there all all programming Python to, to infinitely. If you can write the tests in it, <laughs> well does all the programming take care of itself to to facilitate those tests. So it's a really it's very, very interesting where I think that well, you find the gaps, don't you? you? Find the gaps in the code. You know, you find that you know that that edge condition you didn't you didn't cater for it and it dropped through or whatever. You know, something gone gone astray, or you didn't do a comprehensive test suite. Um, you know, I think it's fascinating. I think it's fast, and more, more and more people are um, are becoming aware of those ramifications. But yeah, that was a bit of a skit that I was going to do a few years ago. That's that thing about my 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 own little wish list. Um, <laughs> obviously, besides reading Spike Milligan uh, books. <laughs> for inspiration um the um the one of the things i was going to ask you about was um the in terms of uh we have this concept called pearls of wisdom and i think you dropped quite a lot of pearls of wisdom today actually it's been a very very interesting episode was what if you were gonna you know you, you've been through this kind of you know roller coaster yeah. of different things you've done is you know are, are there any reflections on um Maybe you've got, you know you've got your special wish wish list or your you know yeah. your wish list, but maybe you've got your maybe your learnings list. What, uh, what if you if you if if you if you any ones that you think spring to mind that could help the audience? I suppose when they yeah. as they are embarking, I know it's some things you have to experience yourself, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know what? Do I, what do I think? I think um, 
I think optimizing for learning is something that people don't do enough. I, I, I really do think that. I mean, I feel that um, the the brain is the brain is a muscle. The brain is a twenty watt effectively, you know, high capacity muscle. Um, mm. What people should be doing through their career, and I think now even more so. I think that you know, the fact that you know, the one thing I can definitely say is that the world in the next twenty years will be different from how the world is today, and I. I would make a bet that the world in the next 20 years will have changed at more of a rate than it did in the last 20 years. I, I'm pretty pretty sure yes. of that. That's one of the things I'd bet on. Mm-hmm. And so I think ever more importantly, it's important to do things that enable you the chance to optimise and to learn. And I think that is yeah, something people don't do enough. People don't spend enough time. People don't spend enough time reading. People don't spend enough time listening i love long form podcasts i think they're really really useful i think people don't have enough time doing things like that where they they kind of expand your mind i think that's one thing that that i've definitely seen i think also trying to understand yourself and however you do that whether that's through you know personal expansion whether that's through kind of taking time but i think it's really important to understand you know what what you're good at and what you're bad at and i think it's really useful to be able mm. to be transparent about that like i i love the fact that the people around me know what i'm rubbish at and they know what i'm good at and i'm totally fine with that they you know i don't there's no i'm not i'm not trying to hide stuff if that makes sense because you're not hung up on it yeah no exactly i've, fa- I've failed more times than you can I, mean, I think that's probably the best thing that came for me from dyslexia is i just failed so many times there's so many things that i've i remember being told thick but i'm thick i remember not being able to do things i remember mm. so much I, I've failed more than anything else. That more than I really have, like I've done so many interviews that I didn't get. I've had so many missed opportunities that just didn't didn't work out for other reasons. And actually, failure is is kind of as weird as it sounds. Probably one of my superpowers. I don't mind failing if I if I get to a point where I stop trying things, then then you know that's that's the reality. That's the that's the wrong thing. I mean, you know, life. Um, people sometimes say life is like baseball, so they'll say like. Life is, you know, you, you, don't, you don't get the ones you don't swing for almost. Well, well, life is even, when you actually think about how baseball works, it's different from life so far as, yes, the analogy works and it's the same, but baseball has um, what's called a uh, truncated outcome distribution. So effectively, if you imagine the <laughs> most you can ever, if you, if you hit a baseball in a, in a in like World Series, the most you can ever have is four, is four runs because base loaded round rather normally the most you ever win is win so you have this yes it's, cons- kind of, so it's constrained basically yeah exactly you have this truncate mm. life is totally the opposite like life has a completely non-truncated outcome distribution there's so many things you'll do that that don't work or some things that will work a bit and then there'll be once this once in a million idea or once in a you know once in a thousand idea that is world changing and i think people need to realize mm. they need to they need to take risks they need to be willing to be prepared to fail and prepared to do things that that they weren't um that and then i think the final thing that i learn um which again i'd recommend f1 to do so i so i think until um i remember it really really vividly so i was working in uh credit suisse you know, large large scale bank um working running a load of their devops stuff at the time and i um i was going through they'd invested a load of, they'd, they'd done a load of stuff they had a big project that was ongoing and i kind of looked at this and i almost thought okay there's a there's an issue with the structure of it they're they're effectively they're adding additional systems on to test together. And actually, to a testing issue, there was almost this this kind of square of complexity that was happening. And I kind of looked at it and went, "Well, if you keep adding systems on, every you have you know two to the power, it's, it's almost going to start to... extrapolating into extrapolating the number of problems you're introducing." Exactly, mm. exactly. And I realised no one had noticed this. No one at all had noticed this. <laughs> and so I kind of went, "Well." It seems like a really serious thing. And I, I went and before that I'd kind of done what people told me to do as weird as it sounds. And so I went off and I basically went, Well, okay, I'm gonna write a paper on this and you know, as a as a contractor, you know, effectively you know, you're 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 there to do what you're contracted to do, if that makes sense. And I remember thinking to myself, Well, I'm just gonna do what I think is you, the right thing to do. You know what you're doing there, see John, you're stepping outside your lane, get back in your lane. Oh, listen, <laughs> and you know what what was weird about it? So I went, I, I spent two weeks building this, writing this document, and it had what I thought the problems was, what I thought would change, and it had you know what I thought we should do about it effectively. And I remember giving this this paper that I'd written. My my boss had wondered where I'd been for the last two weeks. I remember giving it to him, and he, he kind of, said, <laughs> you know, who's who's told you to do this? And I kind of went, no one's told me to do it. I thought this was a, I thought this is what we should do. And he, I thought he was going to tell me off. And he turned around and said, 
that's amazing. That's brilliant. We need to go and show someone else this. And then we, we kind of went off and we showed this to someone else. And they, they, they said exactly the same thing of like, who, who told, who told him to do this? And they were like, no one, no one told him to do this. He's just, he's just done it. And it kind of looped up unbelievably <clears throat> quickly um, until a point that I was talking to some really senior people and really changing, you know, important things. And it kind of taught me that, you know, I'm not hired to do, and I don't think anyone is hired for a job. I think people are hired mm. for who they are. And I think people lose track of that a bit too much that the most mm. important thing for people to do, things to do, both for their, for their happiness, for their direction is, is what you think is the right thing. And I think since then I've, you know, do I the try right not thing. to do the mm. right thing. It sounds really, it sounds really easy, but actually which doing is a very you, old, which is a, which is a very old Viking phrase called Dorath. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. No. So, one of my friends, one of my friends in 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 Denmark, gave me a book that was talking about that. Oh, that's, 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 a re- that's a re- that's a really good one. I mean, I think it's like no, no man. You know, it's like Dad's army. It's like Mannering. Go back. You know, file back up. Yeah. Don't 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 mention that. Don't mention that thing. That, that a good idea you had. That initiative. No, no, no. Don't take an initiative. Get back in. You know, salute, salute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Sense. And I think that's the thing. So I think, you know, the more I optimize my life to do what I think is like, do like, yeah, obviously listen to other people and take, take stuff on board, but you know, do, mm. do what you think is right. I think people only know you are the closest to knowing what you need to do. But you know, at the end of the day, the people that you, you have more hands on experience doing things than other people. Um, mm. And I think that's the thing that, you know, I'd just love to see people do more of that and learn, like it learn, take advantage of all the stuff out there, play with things like, you know, you can go online and spin up a quantum computer. You can, build an AI that that's, you know, it would have taken years. There's all this cool stuff people can do. And I think there's a massive value to that experimentation and play around it. But yeah, that's it. Have fun, have fun, work hard, make history. That's the, that's the goal. Make a dent. Yes. Make a dent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. exactly Read more Spike Milligan. <laughs> Laugh a lot. <laughs> I agree with you on that. No, yeah, it's, it's quite, it's quite good actually. Because you know, it's like even if you've even got a quote on the front here, Milligan is the great god to all of us. John Cleese. I mean, what a fucking great sort of, what a uh, great, great quote that is at the end. I absolutely um, love that. Oh yeah, here you go. The Godfather of alternative comedy, Eddie Izzard. There you go. What a well, quote to finish on. As weird as it sounds, I think this is the this is the thing that people forget about books is. It always, I keep trying to tell this to my daughter that it's, if you imagine um, like orange juice almost, I look at a lot of these things where you've kind of, orange juice is almost this concentrated orange that comes to things. I love reading because I almost feel that it's these people's intelligence just squeezed and concentrated over a really Mm. long period of time. Mm. And it's just there for you to consume, as weird as it sounds. Mm. And you get all of the nutrients without without the work sometimes within it. Um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I look, for, I, look for, I look forward to the Lord Hammond, you know, bringing his next book out or bringing his first book out. It is on. It you is know, definitely on the back. You got to tick it off. You got to tick. It's on the back one. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the Trello board. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. It's well, been th- a pleasure. Thank you. Enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's my line. That's my. He's still on my line. That's been a pleasure for my side as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. That's been John Hammond, um, technology savanteur. I, don't, no, I didn't say uh, <laughs> savant. No, so technology savant, I should say. Um, and thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been it's been a really good episode. It's, we 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 traversed a lot of different topics there, and um, <clears throat> I know that it's taken a while to get on the show because I know you're a busy boy. Uh, but really nice way to start 2024, and uh, let's see where it goes. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.